So there is a crisis brewing in the Democrat leadership in the Washington State uh, Caucus. And I want to really get into the details on this because these are the kind of just insider type stories that oftentimes I don't think, first of all, I know the media will never cover it. And if you actually pay attention, I think, and have people, know people anyway, who work inside the Washington State Legislature or around lobbyists or any people who interact with those who are elected to leadership, you can kind of start to see the fissures and the infighting that goes on there. And I think it's just worth every now and then just discussing this and explaining it so that people understand some of the things that are happening. And right here we have the current Speaker of the House, uh, Representative Lori Jenkins, and she's out of Tacoma. She's been there uh, only for about four years now, and it's been a rocky road under her tenure. And right now, this session right now in 2024 has um, created a lot of angst and anger particularly from the hard leftists within her caucus. And it's funny because it's very hard anymore to find Democrats that are in this caucus that aren't hard left. So it's what we're really talking about, just flavors of left, but uh, and just people who don't like each other or they're always in an internal quest for power. But right now, Lori Jenkins' plans for the Washington State Legislature, they just don't look too fancy or impressive here. And it's not just what she has written on this whiteboard. It's her behavior and failure as the kind of the leader to even deal with basic parliamentary situations that pop up. And this failure, which has actually led to the failure of a lot of different uh, pieces of legislation, this current election cycle, we're in kind of this short session here in 2024, a lot of signature bills that the Democrats presumed that they would get through and some of their lobbyists that support them and kind of the hard left wing of their party was hoping to kind of campaign on, they've fallen apart. And what this has done is this has actually opened her up to challenges from within her caucus. Uh, the most obvious challenger who's kind of vying to uh, boot out Lori Jenkins is uh, Monica Stonier here, who's from Vancouver. She's a legislator from Vancouver. Now, the funny thing is, all these people are people that I've paid attention to for a while. Monica, uh, actually, Lori Jenkins, I caught her pack a few years ago violating campaign finance law. She was actually fined. Uh, it was called the LM pack, if I remember right. And uh, she was fined $300 and had to pay a fine for just violating campaign finance laws. Monica Stone, you're here out of Vancouver. She was caught multiple times. Uh, a couple years ago, I had to file a citizen action notice case against her when that was still allowed. Uh, and it was a settlement of thousands of dollars. I don't remember the amount exactly right now. But she also was recently warned by the Public Disclosure Commission, again, for continuing to violate campaign campaign finance laws. So I do kind of know, know all these people. I keep paying attention to them, and they, they all are lawbreakers, regardless of which side of this fight they're on. But Monica Stonier here is basically deciding that she may want that crown of speaker, and she's already kind of whipping her votes behind the scene and using all of Jenkins' failures, and especially in the parliamentary process here on bills they should have been able to get through the legislature. And so Stonier's trying to use those failures as a reason to gin up enough support that she can take on Jenkins and leadership role. Now, most people believe that none of this stuff ever would have happened under the previous long-term speaker, which is Frank Chop, who is out of Seattle, a legislator out of Seattle, still in the, in the legislature today. But he was former speaker for many, many years until Lori Jenkins took over just a few years ago. And so he was generally considered one of these guys who kind of led um, with an iron fist behind the scenes and really had their caucus whipped into shape. And so I think some of uh, it, at least is generally perceived by a lot of the insiders right now that some of the incompetence and the failures and the infighting and the drama and just screw-ups that you're seeing in the legislature, that's happening because you don't have a guy like this in charge. You have Jenkins who doesn't know what she's doing. It's not true that Stonier would know what she was doing either, but, uh, you know, people are always looking for that crown. And I think Frank Chop here never would have uh, done, had allowed to have happened what's happened recently in the last couple of legislative cycles. Now, uh, I've also gotten Frank Chop in trouble. In fact, he was the first elected official that I was able, or I think a second elected official, I was able to convince Attorney General Bob Ferguson to actually file an Attorney General lawsuit against him in uh, 2017. Uh, so, uh, which ended up, I think, being settled for about $8,500, something like that. Uh, and Frank Chop wasn't too happy with me. I mean, none of, none of these guys that I'm talking about here like me very much. But nevertheless, by paying attention to him, you're going to see that most of these guys are kind of lawbreakers. But let's talk about one of the things that had just happened this last 
last Friday. And it really had to do more with this Emily Randall here, who's a legislator out on the um, in the 26th legislative district, who's jumping in and deciding that she wants to run for Congress in the 6th congressional district, which is kind of the uh, peninsula um, uh, area. And it's going to be a brutal fight in the primary on the Democrat side alone, not including even the Republicans that have jumped in. Uh, but so she wanted some signature piece of legislation out of the House. Now, when you look, talk to staff and you talk to lobbyists, um, this is probably one considered one of the least intelligent legislators that we've ever elected uh, to the state house anywhere in Washington state. And so the piece of legislation that she was trying to push sort of reflected that lack of intelligence or and skill. In fact, it's highly unlikely that she's capable of writing any piece of legislation, but the one that had her name attached to it, probably written by a staffer out of Seattle, there was this weird bill associated with uh, trying to make it impossible to shut down or sell uh, clinics that had something to do with abortion, but it was so poorly written that uh, what happened was the Republicans were trying to fix the insanity that this bill represented just from being an incompetently and poorly drafted piece of legislation. So part of what happens when you get this bill, looks like it's going to go to the floor, um, then of course what you see is legislators, the Republican side and the minority, they're going to try to propose uh, basically amendments to that bill. And in this case, I really want to bring out one of the legislators who really did a good job, a guy who I actually don't know that well here, but he's Representative Robertson. He's actually out of the 35th or 31st legislature kind of up in the Auburn area. Now, 20 years ago, he'd been in the legislature, and he actually knows what it's like to be in the leadership in control of the legislature, because when he was there, the Republicans were still in charge, at least the last time he was in there. And so I think that experience really led him to know how to deal with, uh, when you're in the minority, how to deal with something that the majority is uh, doing that you don't like. And what the Republicans had done is they proposed a whole bunch of amendments to this bill because it was such a weird bill that it looked like the way it was drafted that it applied to veterinarian hospitals, right? What they have to do with abortion, nobody knows. But what it was doing is it was going to make it so difficult because you have to do all this paperwork and administrative rules before you could sell your medical practice. If you had anything to do with abortion, and if you did, then uh, the AG could come in and sue if he didn't like the way the transaction went. It was just bizarre and uh, just an incompetent piece of legislation, which is pretty normal for Democrats. But in this case, what happens is the, the Republicans, because they're coming down to the end of the session here, only so many days left, and nobody really wants to stay in Olympia any longer than they have to because most of these politicians want to get out and start campaigning. So Representative Robertson did, you know, this is just kind of a funny thing. On Friday, they knew that they were they proposed all these amendments. Uh, Lori Jenkins tried to claim they're, they were dilatories. They had nothing to do with the piece of legislation or they were repetitive. But it was ruled that they actually were very important fixes to an incompetent and terribly written piece of legislation. So they were going to have to debate till early hours of the morning the stupid Emily Randall bill. And so uh, this representative uh, basically turned on, uh, if you've heard of the song All Night Long, Lionel Richie, if you don't know, it's an older song from an earlier era. They were playing it on the boombox in the Republican caucus room, and some of the Republican legislators actually, and this, this guy got him out, and they did a conga line outside in kind of in the wings of the of the legislative chamber, you know, uh, singing all night long. We're going to be here all night long passing these. And at some point in time, the Democrats looked at each other and not irrationally. I think they were looking at each other wisely and saying, do we really want to stay here all night arguing over stupid, incompetent, poorly written bill that is nothing but an ego project for Emily Randall's congressional seat? Some, that don't, that some, a lot of them don't even like Emily Randall. They don't want her to win. And so why would they sit there and waste their time on it? And they decided just to pull the plug and and bail out of this whole piece of legislation. To some extent, this was political theater on the floor. It was, uh, but it was also, par you know, there's parliamentary procedures and ruling uh, processes they're going through. And it was widely believed that a bill that Lori Jenkins had probably promised Emily Randall would get through just collapsed and failed. It's just one example of many that's happened recently. And I just think it's worth pointing out a specific example like this. Regardless of some of these details, the inevitable result here is you're going to have a internal schism that's developing into these uh, power bases within the Democrat Party and the leadership. Some of this is being caused by the initiative process, which, as I've done a previous video on, essentially outs the pro-crime and pro-criminal caucus members in the Democrat Party in both the House and the Senate. And they didn't want to be outed so openly uh, in opposing such a popular initiative, and yet they were forced to vote against allowing the police to chase criminals. And so 
a lot of this stuff is happening right now. The failure of the 3% increase on property taxes, the collapse of rent control, all these are the stupid and bad bills um, have fallen apart under Jenkins' leadership. And that's going to expose her to a challenge from Stonier. And I think you're going to have some kind of a fight club scenario develop in the at least behind the scenes right now, and it's going to bubble to the surface before too long, and it may happen uh, surprisingly soon. And, um, you know, the Republicans are influencing that by simply being involved and engaged and not giving up and fighting on stupid, dumb bills all the way to the end in any way that they possibly can. That's what you do. Right now, the Republicans don't control any levers of power in the uh, in the gut the state they don't control the governor's seat they clearly don't control either house in the legislature but they have the possibility of picking up a lot more seats and getting closer to that control or even possibly taking control of one or the other house um, you know either the legislature or the senate if they get out there and some they get the right people running the right positions around the state so lots going on i'll probably talk about that in a separate video but i just simply want to explain and what i like about this is it's another example of how if you're willing to show up and make a difference, you can really have an impact. Because, again, in closing, as I always say, the future belongs to those who show up.